It's a very, very serious time in the life of Jesus right here, obviously. John chapter 19, find verse 28. You see the title of the sermon there on the screen. On Thursday night in Gethsemane, Jesus was obviously arrested. We saw that last week. He was betrayed by Judas, one of his disciples, and then he was left alone by the rest of his disciples there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the chief priest in the Sanhedrin called for secret trials in the dead of night so that they could uh, have a mock trial, so to speak, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the verdict was ultimately handed down, and that verdict was that Jesus would be crucified. And that verdict had to be executed or carried out by Pontius Pilate. And interestingly enough, it reluctantly was. I'll say this in passing because this is not part of the sermon but I really think Pilate had a hard time deciding what he needed to do with Jesus. That's the same story for some of you in here today. You can't quite decide what you need to do with Jesus. I pray today that you'll make the right decision to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Then after a severe beating, Jesus is nailed to the cross where he remains for six long hours until he finally dies. And just before his death, Jesus was able to cry this victorious cry, to tell us die, it is finished. Now that happened on Friday. And so that's the reason we're talking about that today. Next week, we'll talk about what happened on Sunday. But today we're talking about Friday. Now, if you take notes, I've taken three headings from the text so that you can follow along with me. Those three headings are as follows. Heading number one is after this. Heading number two is I thirst. And heading number three is it is finished. So if you have your Bibles open, let's consider John chapter 19. Three verses, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray. Father, uh, the only reason these words aren't as painful as maybe they should be is because of what happened on Sunday. But Father, we have to make sure that we're ready for the death of Jesus so that we can be ready for the resurrection of Jesus. So Lord, it's my prayer that you'll give us an opportunity today to just marinate in, ruminate on the reality of what happened on Good Friday. It's my prayer that every person in this room will take this time seriously Father, this isn't simply something that we do because we don't have anything else to do. We are here together, gathered in this place to worship the resurrected Savior of the world. And so it's my prayer that as we discuss these dark moments, these dark hours in the life of our Savior, you'll remind us the great links that he went to so that he could save us, so that we could be adopted into your family, so that we could spend an eternity with Christ. Father, we love you. I need your help desperately. I pray that you'll speak through me. In fact, I pray that not a single person in here will hear from me today. I pray that every person in here will hear from you. So I pray that your Holy Spirit will intercept my words now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the text opens up, obviously, in verse 28 with after this. And so that begs the obvious question, I think. If you just get to that point, you just read it like I did and you don't have any context, you should say, after what? Right? A after what? Well, obviously, after Jesus' betrayal, uh, after Judas' betrayal of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, after all of his closest friends left him there alone, after Peter denied even knowing him, after Jesus was delivered over to Caiaphas, and Pilate and Herod and back to Pilate after Jesus' own people. Get this one. 
chose to let Barabbas, a known insurrectionist, a known murderer, go free instead of Jesus, it makes no sense to me. The charge that I read earlier, the reason Jesus was on the cross, was not because he was an insurrectionist. It was not because he was a murderer. It was because he was the king of the Jews. I hope you caught that. That's the whole reason I read from Matthew 27. And here you have the very people that Jesus came to die for saying, no, don't let Jesus Jesus go, let this murderer go instead. After Jesus was severely beaten with a whip, all that contained embedded pieces of stone and metal, and he was beaten so much that you couldn't even recognize him as a human. So says Isaiah 52, 14. After Jesus was dehumanized, And after he was mocked, after they put a scarlet robe and a crown of thorns on him, after he carried his cross most of the way to Mount Calvary. I mean, as you go through this list, I mean, it's breathtaking if you study it all week and then you have to stand a sinner a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I've been saved by grace, and I remember the sins that I've committed this past week and this morning and all the rest. I'm a sinner, and I have to stand, and I have to talk about Jesus in this way, and I know that Jesus died for me. I did not necessarily put the nail in His hands, but I did put Him on the cross with my sins. And so when I study this, and I realize this can be a purely academic exercise, and this can be something we do on Sunday because we live in the deep south, we have to realize that Jesus Christ suffered tremendously for every person in this building and so this ain't a time where we go find some Easter frocks and come out and look like an Easter egg this is a time when we come in and we realize that a man died on the cross so that we could have life forever with him and so when I get to this I'm saying God how can you save me wretched sinner as I am And every single fleeting moment of my Savior's life was predestined in eternity past. So He knew what I would be doing in 1999 and in 2000 and in 2001 and in 2002. And He still chose to go to the cross at Calvary to redeem me. That's what we're studying today. After this... After the Romans nailed Jesus to a cross and hoisted Him up, which must have slammed down into the hole, tearing at His hands and tearing at His feet. After Jesus cried out to the Father, Eli, Eli, Lima Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is only after this excruciatingly long ordeal that Jesus finally died. And so man, His death is here before us now. Please please don't miss the emphasis. Seminary professor always said, don't yell to make your point, so forgive me. I am not apologizing for passion. Because I don't deserve to be standing here today. I don't. But Jesus Christ died for me anyway. Now, this text, I don't know if this pulpit will hold up to much of that, right? Slamming on it. But this text points to the reality of a big word. Kids, listen if you're in here. It points to Jesus' omniscience. It doesn't even matter if you can't say that or spell that. That simply means that Jesus knows everything. Jesus knows everything. Verse 28 says, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the Scripture, I thirst. Now, Jesus knows everything because God is all-knowing and Jesus is God. Make sure you put that in your brain and don't ever forget it. And He knows every single detail. He knows what has to be accomplished. He knows what hasn't been accomplished. He knows that all Scripture has to be fulfilled. And He knows that there's one prophecy that's yet to be fulfilled. And He alludes to that specific prophecy when He says, I thirst. And that prophecy that He's talking about comes from Psalm 69, 21, which says, They gave me poison for food. And for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. 
So that prophecy had to be fulfilled. And Jesus gets that prophecy rolling by saying, I thirst. And then we read verse 29. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Now, this is not the same wine that I read about earlier. The wine that I read about earlier was mixed with myrrh so that it served as a sedative, so that it would take some of the pain away. Jesus didn't take that wine because Jesus didn't want to diminish the full wrath of God coming on him for the sins of the world. So he didn't take it. And the interesting side note here that I think you should get is that the soldiers used a hyssop branch to lift this sour sponge to Jesus' mouth. God's people in Exodus 12 used a hyssop branch to spread the blood of the sacrificed lamb on the cross beam and the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over their house and not kill their firstborn. So these Jews had to go back in their mind and think about the blood of the sacrificed lamb that saved them. But here we have Jesus, the only true and final sacrificial lamb. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Man, the hyssop branch is important here. Don't miss it. This is the sacrificial lamb. This is the one that the sacrificial system was pointing to. Jesus Christ is that lamb. Man, I love that connection. And I've heard some sermons built around the hyssop branch. I'm not smart enough to preach one there. But check that connection out later. Go back and read all of Exodus and think about how God passed over those individuals because the blood was applied. Hey, look, the same thing happens to you when you trust in Jesus. God's wrath passes over you because His blood has been painted all over you when you say yes to Him. Praise Jesus doesn't really get any better than that. Now, the sour wine, I mean, scholars don't have a clue why it was there, okay? But it was probably there to quench the soldier's thirst. But nonetheless, Jesus took this wine to fulfill Scripture, to wet his lips, to wet his parched throat. He was dying, by the way, so that he could cry out to tell us die. It is finished. So that takes us to verse 30, moving right along. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So that text is pointing out a reality that sometimes we forget. The life of Jesus was a life given, not a life taken. Here's what Jesus said prior to this text in John 10, 17, and 18. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. It is finished. And I am the one who finished it. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, I have to say a word here about Greek, and I don't want to bore you, but this text doesn't make any sense if we don't get to this. I don't believe. The verb teleo, which is translated in our English versions as fulfilled or finished in verse 28, depending on your version, and again finished in verse 30. It's used in its different forms to point to the reality of Christmas. Why do we have Christmas? Why do we have Jesus becoming flesh? The verb doesn't simply mean to finish the sermon or for some of you in here right now to finish your nap, right? It means to bring to completion a destined goal. So when Jesus says to tell us die, it is finished, he's not just saying uh, my earthly life is over. He's referring to the completion of his destined goal, which is redemption, which is paying the price for the sins of his people. That's what Jesus is saying, is, is, is said is taking place. 
That's what's finished. By the way, this goal was determined in eternity past. This didn't slip up on Jesus and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, this plan of redemption was determined in eternity past. Nothing ever catches God by surprise. You know that, right? Uh, now I hope you know that. I'll say this briefly. I don't even know if I included it in the notes. I did, but you can study that later. But here's the reason I know that this was planned in eternity past. One of the reasons, because in Ephesians chapter 1, in verses 3 through 6, Paul teaches us that God the Father initiated and ordained salvation. Then, in Ephesians 1, verses 7 through 12, God the Son achieved that salvation for us on the cross at Calvary. Then, in Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, God the Spirit applies salvation to us when we believe. So here's my point. This wasn't plan B for the Trinity. They didn't have a council up in heaven and say, what are we going to do with all of these wayward people? This plan was determined in the mind of God in eternity past. This was the plan all along. Don't miss that. This is not, ah, the Romans got Jesus. Ah, the uh, Jews got Jesus. This is, ah, God was pleased to crush Jesus because this was the plan. And that plan included you. And it included me. So this text then is showing us the reality that Christ came to seek and save the lost and that was accomplished completely on the cross. Christ, in other words, finished bearing the wrath of God for the sins of His people. It is finished. Now what difference does all this make to us? I mean, I think that's the question that we have to ask of every text, especially this one. It's a very well-known text. There's always a danger when you come to church around Christmas and Easter because you already know the story most of the time. Mm, but let's dig a little deeper. I want to show you, if you want to turn to Luke 23, I would. Luke 23, 39. I want you to notice two responses from the criminals that watch Jesus die. And I'll finish up with this. Luke 23, 39. Jesus was crucified with the robber on either side of him. Here's what Luke 23, 39 says. One of the criminals who hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now we know from the other gospel writers that both of these robbers, to begin with, were actually yelling at Jesus. But something is evidently happening here with one of the criminals, right? This guy's having a change of heart. Look at the text again in verse 40 and following. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds. But this man, referring to Jesus, has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. So this man is literally converted watching Jesus die. Don't, don't, don't miss this. Matthew and Mark tell us that this very man was hurling abuse at Jesus to begin with. This man was blaspheming Jesus, and now Jesus is saving the blasphemer. There's not a sin on planet earth that you can't be saved from, right? Not a person in here has probably hurled any abuse toward Jesus. So whatever that sin is you're fighting with day in and day out, you can be forgiven of that sin. And I know that because of what I read based on this criminal dying on the cross beside Jesus Christ. Man, this is a, really a powerful story. This man knows that he's a sinner. Did, did you catch that? He knows that his buddies, his buddy is a sinner as well. Right? We're receiving the due reward of our deeds. We're getting what we need. We're getting what we deserve. What's that reward? Do y'all know? This guy had never, that's right, this guy had never read Romans. But does not the Bible say that the wages of sin is death? And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? This guy's turning into a theologian here in the last hour of his life. He's realizing some things that he never even thought about before. 
He's criminal. Uh, I know he's converted. I know he is because he tries to convert his buddy. He's like, do you not fear God? I mean, to paraphrase, dude, we're dying. We're dying today. Can you not shut up talking about this man who is Jesus? He is indeed the Son of God. Can you not wake up and say yes to Him? I just, I just can't really imagine that scene. This guy knows something else. Jesus is sinless, right? Did you read that in the text? This man has done nothing wrong. So this robber is basically confessing his sins. He knows that he's a sinner deserving of death for all the wrongs that he's ever done. And he knows that Jesus Christ is the answer to his sin problem. And guess what? This guy never even got a Sunday school pen for high attendance. (laughs) Right? He never had a single church potluck. Not ever. He never had an opportunity to hear John Piper or Billy Graham preach the gospel. He never heard Johnny Cash sing about Jesus. Never heard David Crowder sing about Jesus. Never had communion. Never got baptized. Because baptism isn't a condition of salvation. And yet he knows that he needs Jesus. Up until this point in this man's life, he had never made a single stride toward God. God was the furthest thing from his mind. I don't need God. I don't want God. I'll do things the way I want to do things. I'll live my life and make my money and have my girlfriends I ain't worried about God and all of a sudden on the cross the grace of the Father draws this man to the Son to the, uh, to the Son of, of God and he's changing right here right he is cha- this is a deathbed confession so to speak hmm. how does this man really come to the conclusion that Jesus and forgive sins. All right? He must have heard Jesus a few verses earlier in Luke 34 say of his executioners, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So this criminal knows that forgiveness of sin is available to him through Jesus Christ. Hey, that forgiveness is available to you too makes no difference what you did before you came here today. Man, forgiveness is available for your sins. And the moment that uh, this robber confessed his sins and he asked Jesus to remember him, Jesus saved him and he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Not next week, not next month. Not in a place of holding today, you will be with me in paradise. If you've lost loved ones and they believed in Jesus, they're with Jesus even as we speak right this very moment. Now, uh, just quickly, I hope that you noticed all the salvific elements in this text because they're all there, uh, every single one. First of all, this criminal saw that God is to be feared. I don't really know that people fear God today. Even people in church, we throw God's name around like it's a curse word sometimes. All right? I'll go ahead and say this in public so I can be on record saying it. I think it would be better to say a swear word than it would to use the Lord's name in vain by saying, Oh my God! Don't even text it. Call me fundamental if you want to because I am. I just happen to be in jeans with an untucked shirt. I think we need to be careful how we use God's name, don't y'all? No, I'm not saying you don't. I'm not saying if you texted, "Oh my God," last night and you didn't mean, "Oh my God." I'm not saying anything ugly about you. I'm just saying I think we ought to fear God. Now, obviously, you're probably saying, "Well, obviously, this guy he had a healthy fear because he was dying." What does it take for us? Right? Read the story of this man. He understands that God is not to be trifled with. In fact, he's about to die. (laughs) Number two, this guy admitted that he had done wrong. It's the first thing I tell little tykes when parents say they're ready to be saved. The first thing they have to understand is sin. Do you know you sin? 
can you tell me one of your sins? And some of them will look at me like I'm a dummy, and I know they're not ready to see Jesus, because Jesus reveals our sin to us. He lets us know when we're sinners. Now, uh, nine-year-olds won't have the same kind of sin that, we, that, that adults have. But if your nine-year-old is asking you about salvation and she can't tell you that she's a sinner because she cheated on a test at school or because she popped her best friend upside the head or because she talks bad about her parents under her breath, well, then she's probably not ready to receive Jesus as her Lord and Savior because even a man on the cross dying, taking his last breath, realizes that he's a sinner and he's getting exactly what he deserves. Okay, number three. This man acknowledges that Jesus is without sin. Number four, Jesus is a king. And number five, he pleads for Jesus to help him. So, if we use all of the scripture in today's text, we realize that we have to believe two primary things to get saved. Okay, if you take notes, I'd take them down. Number one, you've got to believe that Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords who died who was buried and who was resurrected on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And number two, you have to believe that you're a sinner by birth and you're a sinner by choice. You can't blame your sin on your environment or on your parents. I'm, I'm not saying your environment and your parents can't contribute to your sinfulness, but you're a sinner because you were born. Now, I'm not trying to be ugly to you. We were sinners because we were born. We're not born headed to heaven. We're born going in the wrong direction because we're born sinners. Now, I know you're saying, well, this five-month-old baby's not sinning. Well, I didn't say that. But you need to understand that biblically speaking, we're depraved individuals. And we need Jesus. So then here's what you have to believe. you got to believe what the Bible says about Jesus and you got to believe what the Bible says about you. Now, pop culture today says that we're not really sinners. We really don't have a problem. Again, it's, it's to hear AOC tell it, it's our environment. It's because we were born in a poor family. It's because mom and daddy are Christians, right? That's what AOC would say. It's because of these other things. It's because of all these other... You're a sinner because of A, B, C, D. And all we need to do is to get you to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and they can help you get through life. Well, they might can, but you need Jesus first. So this is not... I mean, I know I'm saying this like you are. Yeah, this is not a common thing in America today that we are sinners deserving of God's wrath. Most people don't ever assume that they're sinners. Most people assume, well, I'm a pretty good old boy. Well, hell is filled with good old boys that never realized they were sinners and they needed Jesus. By the way, to make a connection to some of these nuts that don't believe we're sinners, that's the reason they never believe we need Jesus. That's the reason angry atheists are angry atheists. That's the reason this one man died rebuking God on the cross because he didn't believe he was a sinner and he didn't need a sinless man because he was okay himself. Friends, don't make that grave mistake. When uh, the head knowledge of the gospel becomes the heart knowledge of the gospel is when one is saved. When the gospel seeps into your pores, when it seeps into the very frame of your existence, that's when real salvation takes place. Friends, you can know all this stuff until you're blue in the face. Knowing it's not going to help you. It is not going to help you. And I believe when the head knowledge becomes heart knowledge, it's confirmed. It's confirmed when you confess your sins and trust in Jesus. When you plead for this perfect one to help you, I believe that's when you know you've trusted that Jesus is who the Bible says he is and you really are who the Bible says you are. Huh. Right? I'm, I'm trying to be tender and not call you a sinner. So I'll just call myself a sinner because we're sinners. Uh, and if you go to a church uh, normally that doesn't mention sin a lot, you're going to the wrong church. If you're reading books that, that'll tell you you shouldn't mention sin, you're reading the wrong books. Some theologians will be on the radio when you leave here today. They won't even say the word sin because that's just not their thing. Well, that is our thing if we're preachers. 
If you're positive speaking an Anthony Robbins type, then that's fine. But if you're a gospel preacher, the only reason we know we need the gospel is because we should know that we're sinners. And so somebody has to tell us that. And I tell myself that every time I open a text of Scripture. Has the gospel ever moved from your head to your heart? That's a question that you're saying, well, obviously it has. We're so churched down here in the South. I'm, I'm not really sure. I think some people believe head knowledge will get you to heaven. I know all this stuff. Friends, head knowledge is not going to help you. I think that's another reason some people have a hard time with a 10-year-old coming to faith in Christ. They're too young. R really? How much head knowledge do you have to have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? Y'all help me with this because I'm ready. I'm ready for some help here. I had a little girl one time that I couldn't baptize. Man, she had been saved. She was eight years old. Over and over again. And I wasn't about to get in a fight with her mom and dad. Because mom thought baby was ready to be saved. Daddy didn't. She's not old enough. She doesn't know enough. And so I just tenderly said to this little sweet girl, Well, baby, look, here's the deal. You believe in Jesus, you go into heaven. Whether you get baptized in the next few months or the next few years. I said, but I ain't finna get no conversation with your parents about it. Because I know how that's going to turn out. Because it's going to look like two of us are ganging up on one. I want y'all to hear me right now. I, I, the whole, I don't have time to go through this, but the whole construct of why you have to be a certain age to get saved, it's got Roman Catholic roots and First Communion roots. We're Protestant in here. Do y'all realize that? So we don't believe that you have to be seven before you can get saved because we don't believe communion saves you in the first place. We believe God does. And the only heart knowledge you have to have is that Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. And if I put my trust in Him, I can be saved. Now, I don't need a whole bunch of texts and emails about all you folks that disagree with me on how young a child can be saved. Okay, Because you're fine to have your own opinion. But I just want you to know that part of the reason we really don't believe that uh, little ones can get saved. Man, i got to walk on quiet, soft ground here. Is because we've been working off of a head knowledge. And not a heart knowledge. I want somebody to stand up and tell me how much you can understand from Genesis to Revelation to be worthy of being saved. Man, you can't learn enough. Just like you can't work enough. So I pray, man, I pray with all my heart that you know that Jesus is your Savior because your gut tells you. Because your heart, not because some preacher told you before. I mean, not because I, I have had a meeting with you in my office and I ask you some questions and you got the right answers. I'm going to tell you something. I believe most people in this room, if you say you're a Christian, I believe you know if you're really Christian or not. But I'm here today to help you if you don't know. One criminal went with Jesus. The other criminal went off into eternity completely separated from Jesus right by himself. Rebuking God with his last breaths. Friends, you want to know why atheists are so angry? Study this man on the cross that was rebuking God to his face until he took his last breath. Man, if you're in here today and you're fighting God, you're going to lose the battle. You can rebuke him or you can use your churchiness to get you into heaven until your last breath. You can use your, I've been to church all my life. You can use your, I've been baptized. You can use your, I've spoken in tongues. You can use your, I've been sprinkled as an infant. You can use whatever you want and none of it will ever be good enough to get you into glory. The only thing that will get you there is a heart belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and what happened on the cross at Calvary. If you're in here today banking on any of that other stuff to get you there, it's not going to work. I can't think of all of it. But it's not going to work. So there it is. Uh, the most horrible day in the history of the world is called Good Friday. What Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. Friends, it's called Good Friday because that's the day that Jesus Christ achieved salvation for his people. To tell us die. It is finished. I'm going to ask you to stand.
as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, uh, we love you and we thank you for this, this amazing reality of salvation available to anyone who calls on you. Father, there's not a sinner in this building that can't receive grace. It's not a sinner in here that can't be forgiven of their sins. And it's pretty clear that those sins be forgotten. Father, it's my prayer that as we just contemplate the words that have been said and hopefully the Holy Spirit's drawing, you'll give us an honest opportunity to appraise our hearts today before you. Father, if you uh, have any work to do, <laughs> I mean, it's 1032. We're not in a hurry, God. It's my prayer that you'll work during this time of response. It's my prayer that in the strong name of Jesus, all these sweet folks in this room today will understand that the only way we can get into heaven is to believe in Jesus and trust in Him with everything that we have. Father, I pray that this hit home to somebody today. And if not, I pray that you'll continue to work on them. We ask you now to have your way during this time. In Jesus' name, amen.